All right, so now that we have our solution here, we can start building a reconstruction from that. So first of all, let's hit shift spacebar to go out of full screen and then drag this triangle down to create the 3D viewport. Okay, so next thing would be to add the camera solver constraint to the camera and also to add the viewport background images. But uh, since that is quite a bit of clicking, uh, you can make that a little bit faster because there is a little nice button here that will make your life easier. Therefore, go here in the tool shelf down to the clip panel and when you click the button set up tracking scene, everything will be done for you. So you will have the markers, the camera will have the camera solver constraint and when you look through the camera you will also have the background images. Now something else has happened, that is now you have this plane on this layer here, but currently we don't need that, so just disable this layer so that we only have that one. Okay, so next thing would be we have to orient the scene. And to do that, if you already know that, we can go to the reconstruction mode. So in here, maybe bring that down, also this one, and then go up here to the orientation panel. So first thing to do would be to assign a floor plane. And for the floor, you need three points on the floor. So let's use maybe this one, that one, and this one here in the background. So with that selected, click on set floor. Everything has gone, but that is also because the scene is a little bit too large. And it is kind of random when and how Blender will create such a huge scene, but we can fix that by setting another scale. So for that we will also use the orientation panel. So maybe let's use these two markers here in the window frame because we might know that this is maybe one meter or one meter and ten centimeters or so. Um, but let's just use one meter for that. So select these two and with these two markers selected you can go here to the set scale button, click on that and that will now scale everything so that the distance between these two points is now one blender unit. Okay, so that looks already much better and if you play back that looks kind of nice. But currently it is really hard to see the markers and that is because setting a scale will also scale down the camera object. So even the camera object is hard to see and because the 3D markers are kind of parented to the camera object, when you scale the camera you will also scale down these markers. So maybe let's first make the camera a little bit better visible by going to the camera properties and down here in display just increase the size. So just that we see the camera object that will have no impact on rendering or compositing. This is just for the display. And then also so that we can see the markers better, let's press N to bring up the sidebar, then go down here to motion tracking and here we can now increase the size. Let's try one or maybe even bigger, something like that. Go full screen and now we can really nicely see all these markers here. Okay, so now to orient that, to rotate it, we could go to top view by pressing 7 and then 5 to make that autographic and then just rotate it with R and that works pretty good, but you could also try to use markers for that. Now in order to do that, you would have to have any marker that is on a line where you have some, well, something to align that to. So of course we could use something here and try to align that, but there is nothing in line with this marker. So I mean that marker that is not on any line that is parallel to the building here. And also we cannot use these ones because even though these are parallel, it would kind of mess up the whole thing with the floor because the alignment in that case works in relation to the origin. So first you would have to set an origin like for example this marker down here and then set origin like so so that brings everything over here and now you can align that by selecting a second marker just 
that one for example, and then assign that as x-axis or y-axis. But because this marker is not on x or y-axis, that doesn't make any sense. So in that case, it would have been good if you would have tracked something here on the border of this building, for example, this point and something here. So let's just quickly do that by adding one marker here, press Ctrl T, track that, go back to frame one, then select this one, Ctrl T, and then pay attention because the column here is going in front of that. So we have to go back a little bit and then here press Alt T to clear everything that comes after this frame because here the marker is clearly sliding. So go to this frame where you have that still on the correct feature point here and then hit Alt T and now Shift S to recalculate that. And now still looks pretty fine, but now we can assign that point as origin. So select this, then click on set origin. And now select that marker and assign that as X axis. Or if you want to, you can also assign it as Y axis. But I think X axis is pretty fine. The only thing that I want to change is uh, it would be nice if the camera would be on the other side because that is kind of how I feel the scene looks like. So cameras here, I look in that direction. So it would be nice if that would be reflected here in top view as well. And to do that, you can just press on that button again. So clicking that button twice will just flip the solution just to try the other side. And now we have the markers here aligned on that plane. And that looks pretty fine, I think. So when you now press zero to look through the camera, we can select the cube, go to edit mode with tab key and then hit G Z one, because I know that the default cube is two blender units and that the default origin is here in the center. So pressing G Z one will move it up one blender unit so that the origin of this cube is now here at the center and that just makes it easier to place it, to scale it, to move it around and stuff like that. So now everything works and it looks pretty fine. It's just that up here something seems to go wrong because if you watch this marker then you can see it should be on the white point but it's not. So this is sliding and not doing the right thing. And also if you watch this marker, this should be over here in that corner. So something's wrong. And what we don't have yet is a correct undistortion. I mean, we did calculate these distortion values, these K1, K2 values, but we are not using them yet. So somehow we have to apply the lens distortion to our scene. But because Blender cannot render uh, in a distorted way, so the lines that you have in 3D view will always be straight lines. So that cannot be the solution. So instead we have to not distort the viewport. We have to undistort the footage so that our footage will show us straight lines so that the footage will fit to the points here in the 3D viewport. Now to do that, we can make use of these values here. So with this information, we can understort our footage. And to do that, we will go down here to the proxy panel. Maybe let me just close all these. So in the proxy panel, we can first of all, we can make the checkbox here. And what these proxies are, I will explain that later. Basically, it's just a way so that you can build smaller files, just in case you have very large files or very big footage that doesn't fit into your RAM, then you can build smaller versions of that to have faster display. But for now, what I want to do is to just enable this and then go down here to the checkbox render undistorted and enable that. And by doing that, you can see how this now undistorts the footage. So everything that was kind of bent before is now a straight line. 
So when I now draw a straight line with D and control, like so, now that totally fits to our grease pencil. So we have undistorted the footage and let me just erase that again. So now we can see this undistorted footage here in the movie clip editor, but still this doesn't have any effect on compositing or anything else. So this is really just for the display. And especially that checkbox is only there to display the undistorted version of the footage on the fly here in the movie clip editor. So because we only need to see it in the 3D viewport, we can also disable that here. Then go back in the 3D viewport and you can already see that here our markers fit to their original positions. And that is because in the background images, by default, you have enabled the option render undistorted, even though you didn't have built any proxies. So as soon as you set the movie clip as background image, especially if you do that with the setup tracking scene button or set as background, you will have automatically enabled the option render undistorted. So everything that you see here when you play back now will be generated on the fly live. It will not be pre-rendered. It will be just be rendered while you are playing back. And that happens only if you have enabled the checkbox here for the proxy and timecode panel. So when you disable that, you also won't see the undistorted version here in the viewport. But since that is now generated on the fly, you will also not have any real-time playback. So in order to have that, we can build a proxy. So I want to enable that checkbox again and then build proxies Maybe not for 25%, that would be really small, but maybe just for half of the size of my original footage. And I want to build the proxies for both, for the original distorted version or the version that has the lens distortion. And also I want to build it for the undistorted version. So there will be two different versions of the proxy. And now to build that, I can click on build proxy. Okay, so that has now finished and we can switch to the proxy render size in the movie clip editor by going to proxy size 50% and that will now exchange the footage to 50%. And I think I've just found a bug because proxy size 50% should not be so blocky. Okay, so that obviously is wrong, but if you turn on render undistorted, it will switch to the undistorted version, 50% of that, and that looks correct. Okay, so right after recording that, I will go to the IRC channel and complain and file a bug report. Um, but let me just disable that for the movie clip editor, because here we don't need that. We best use the original data. But in the 3D viewport, we can now also enable proxy 50% and now we can play back real time because Blender doesn't have to calculate that on the fly. You can just load the pre-rendered version here from your hard drive. So now that we've got that, we can finally start inserting some objects here. I mean, we already do have this cube, but it sits there a little bit lame here in the background. So maybe let me just move that in the foreground with G, Y, make it smaller, also rotate it around the z-axis and then maybe duplicate it with shift D and then move it here so that we've got these two cubes sitting there on the ground. Or maybe we can also add some text. So shift A, text, alt G to clear the location. Maybe move it over here. So I select this marker with my right mouse button, hit shift S3 to snap the cursor there then select the text and hit shift s2 so now the text is here and with rx i can rotate it 90 degrees around the x-axis so now we've got the text there and maybe it could be tracking is awesome make it a bit smaller so that oh not all summer so text and let me just move these cubes back. Okay, so we've got text here. And let's also make the text 3D. 
So I leave the full screen mode, then go here to the object data of the text and add an extrude value here. So in the geometry, adding extrude value will make it 3D. But now before I render that, I want to also enable this layer again. Remember that has been added automatically, but I have disabled that so that we can concentrate on this text here. So now that we have this layer enabled again, I can press F12. And magically, we've got the text, we've got some shadow, and it is integrated into the footage. Of course, the integration is not that great because the lighting is horrible. Uh, there are a couple of things missing, but uh, overall, in principle, it works. Maybe we can quickly improve that just by moving the lamp over here because if you look at the footage then you can see that the light is clearly coming from behind the camera. So let's put the light source also here. And then also maybe change that from a point lamp to an area light. Because point lamp would be just like a light bulb and light would go in every direction. So let's change that to an area light. So go to the lamp properties with the lamp selected and switch from point to area. Now, before we can use that, we have to fix a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we have to fix the rotation. So the vector of the area light indicates that the light is going in this direction. So of course we have to rotate that so that the light is going into the direction of the scene, like so. And then here in the properties, I also want to make it a little bit larger. So go to area shape, then I change it to rectangle because then I can make it a little bit wider. And then most importantly, not to make it too bright, uh, I want to lower the distance. So set the distance to something like, I don't know, four blender units and render again. And that looks already a little bit better, at least from the direction. But something that really doesn't look convincing is that the shadow is so sharp. And to fix that, we can go to the shadow properties of the area light and then increase the number of samples maybe to seven for X and Y. And when you render that, then you will have nice and smooth shadows. Okay, and that looks already quite good. Now, why is that working anyway? Well, that is because Blender will do everything for you automatically when you enable Setup Tracking Scene. So that will not only bind the camera solver to the camera and create all these points, um, but it will also create this background plane on the second layer and it will move the lamp from layer 1 to layer 1 and layer 2. So with the lamp active, you can see that now the lamp is on both layer 1 and layer 2. Or actually that is not layer 2, it's layer 11, but just the layer below layer 1. So that one here. And most importantly, it will also set up the render layers for you. So when you go to the render buttons and then look at this, you've got foreground and background layer. And the foreground layer will only render what's on the first layer and mask out everything that is on layer 1 with everything that is on this layer here. So that is the mask layer. You will also have the vector pass and the background layer will only activate that one and it will give you shadow and ambient occlusion. And to make this all work and give you a final result, um, Blender has also set up a compositing node tree for that. So let's go to the compositing layout here and have a look at that. So we've got, if you go full screen, we've got three streams. First one is of course the movie clip and it goes through an undistortion node and the scale node, of course. And that will undistort the footage. And I can show you that by enabling the backdrop and then activating the viewer node. So control shift click on the movie clip output. And this is the original movie clip. And with alt and middle mouse button, I just drag the backdrop here uh, below so that I can show you the result here on the images because when you now control shift click on the undistortion node you can see how this becomes now undistorted just as our proxies. And now that this is undistorted it is being scaled then you've got shadow and ambient occlusion being mixed together and then multiplied over the footage.
Now, how and why this works, I will explain in a very short next chapter for everyone who doesn't know how to do this kind of compositing. But uh, for those of you who already know that, uh, this would probably just be boring. So I want to do this very quickly. So we've got the output of the scale node, then the shadow and ambient occlusion pass that is being multiplied over the footage. And I've lowered the factor because with factor one, it would be a little bit too strong. So you've got that. And after that, you've got the foreground layer. The foreground layer uses a vector blur to create the motion blur of the camera. So there's very tiny difference. And after that, it is just being alpha overed over the stream with a shadow and footage. And that is the final result. And of course, in between, you can do all kinds of things. For example, if you wanted, you can use RGB curves to do some color corrections to try to make it fit a little bit better, maybe by increasing the red and green values, even though this is not really an improvement in this case. But anyway, so you can do some color corrections. You can also do a final color correction by using RGB curves on the last output here to increase the contrast. Maybe not that much, but you know what I mean, like that. And if you want to, you can also add vignetting or filtering, maybe some sharpening, sharpen filter, of course, not with factor one, but something like 0 0.05. So just a very subtle effect like so. And with that, you can combine the CG elements with the footage. And of course, it is very important that you use this undistortion node, because if you don't and just erase that with control X, then you have the distorted image, the original image. And here it doesn't matter that much because um, here you don't have that much distortion. But if you would have an element up here, then it would not fit to the footage. Maybe I can show you very quickly by going back to my original layout, then select this marker in this corner, shift S3, then add a cube on that, make it a little bit smaller, move it over like so, shift S2 again, just to really make it stick to the exact same position of the marker, like so. Yeah, more or less, anyway, like so. So that sits here and of course, it has to be on layer one, so M and then move to layer one. All right, now let's render that again. And if you don't have this undistortion node, then it would be on the wrong position. So if in the viewport, you can see that this edge is right here on this white point in the footage here, then in the final render, it is slightly behind that. And that is simply because I have erased the undistortion node, so the CG doesn't fit over the original footage anymore. And uh, now I can go ahead and add another distort node. So Shift A, distort, and then use movie distortion. And the movie distortion can use different movie clips. If you have different movie clips in your uh, movie clip editor, and then you can choose which clip you want to use from here. If you only have one clip, then it should be set as the default. And also the default is that it is set to undistort. Okay, so now I can drag that between that and it will distort the whole thing again. So now that fits. So this is now in the correct position. Now I erase that again with Control X and add another um, distort node, movie distortion, because you could also think that you might want to not distort or not to undistort the footage, but that you want to distort the CG. Because if you apply the same lens distortion to your CG elements as the footage has, then it would fit as well. So you can set this from undistort to distortion, and then just move that here behind the vector blur. You can see that it takes a little bit longer for whatever reason, I don't know. Distortion just seems to be a little bit slower than undistortion. Anyway, this cube now looks correct again. But now if you have a look at this area, there is a little problem. And that is simply because we are distorting the CG elements. So that means we are bending them, like the footage has also been bent by the lens. So we're doing the same thing to our CG elements. 
and in the original that E is here right on the edge of the frame, but by distorting that we move it inwards. But now because we don't have rendered anything here in this area, because the image is just limited here, well there is nothing that Blender could bend. So that is a little problem with the distortion currently. In the future we hopefully will have overscan. Overscan would mean that you render with um, a little bit larger area here, so you would add an extra render space outside of the limits of the frame that would also be rendered. And if you then distort that, you would have enough image material that you can bend inwards so that you don't have these kind of artifacts. And of course these artifacts would also um, be generated if you distort the footage. So if you look at the original again, so that is the original, and if you distort that, then also you have these kind of artifacts. So for now the easiest way to deal with distortion is just to undistort the footage. You will lose a little bit of quality because um, of this undistortion, so there are some pixels missing, but uh, in most cases that is not really that big of a problem. So currently you will always have straight lines in your final result. But in the future, hopefully we will get overscan. So in that case, you can just keep the footage as it is, just without this undistortion node, have the original, have also the original bend lines. But because of the overscan, you will then be able to use the distort node on your CG elements. Okay, so, but for now we just use that and that is just as fine. Okay, so uh, in the next chapter I will break this down again and uh, explain that a little bit more in depth how this all works. So for everyone who already knows how to composite that kind of stuff you can just skip the next chapter. Okay, but before I close this chapter I can tell you some good news because yesterday Sergei has already fixed this problem with the proxies. So that will now work and I can demonstrate that. So when I go back to the movie clip editor and now build the 50% proxies of the without the undistortion, so these ones. So if I build that now and then go to use 50% proxy, you won't have this blocky shapes. So that looks now okay. It uses a much uh, better compression. So all these artifacts that you've seen before are now gone. So that is fixed. So you see Blender has a really great development. Uh, bugs get fixed immediately, at least if you report them. So that's fine for now. Okay, so that is the basic workflow of tracking a rather simple shot and how to composite that I will show you in the next chapter and after that we will have a look at some more tracking techniques.